Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my links on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. I'd like to start with some words from The Burning Word by Judith Konst. I was 19 years old before it dawned on me that the 23rd Psalm was not written in English. Of course, I had known for many years that the books my tradition called the Old Testament were written in Hebrew, and the books we called the New Testament were written in Greek. But it wasn't until I was in college that a little window opened in my mind, and I suddenly encountered the fundamental otherness of my Bible's language. The psalmist was not a late 20th century American. The psalmist was not a young girl lying on her rubber-lined mattress in a college dorm room, grieving the betrayal of a high school boyfriend and searching for some comfort among the words of a poem she had known since childhood. You anoint my head with oil. The psalm declared my cup overflows. Suddenly the Bible's foreignness overwhelmed me. The book I held in my hand had come to me down many twisting trails and through many transmongomerations of language. And it was a miracle. It was an oracle. It was mine and not mine all at once. My realization that the psalm was written in an ancient tongue, I see now, was the comfort I was seeking. For when I tucked that suddenly strange text under my arm and walked outside with an inexplicable need to get moving, I felt the trees and the very sidewalks holding me up, felt them as created things that were a bodied part of God's tapestry, God's text. The language of the Bible was real. The sidewalks were real. My broken heart was real. But I had not fallen through the world. I didn't have to know why this had happened or how it fit into some larger cosmic plan. I just had to know that God's word and the world were real. The sense of realness of the Bible I've discovered is fundamentally Jewish in nature. It's why Orthodox Jewish women still sometimes lean into the aisle to kiss the Torah scroll as it's carried to the front of the synagogue. It's why the first act of young boys beginning their studies in medieval yeshivas was to lick smeared honey off chalk slates inscribed with Bible verses. It's why the Torah is never thrown out or given away, even when worn beyond repair, but rather it's buried in a special cemetery for scripture. My family and the evangelical churches I grew up in put great emphasis on the Bible, its authority, its centrality. My parents joined our church not because the people were friendly or the sermons were good, but because the congregation grounded its identity explicitly in the Bible. Each member of my family had his or her own Bible, given as a special birthday or Christmas gift, and we packed the small volumes in our suitcases for trips as automatically as we packed our underwear and toothbrushes. Yet as much as we loved the Bible, we didn't sacralize it. Though we treated our leather-bound books with the utmost care, it would never have occurred to us to revere the physical text itself, to locate God's actual transforming presence in the crinkly pages, the twin columns of text, the word in which opens the first chapter of Genesis, or the words hallelujah at the end of Psalms. It didn't matter to us whether we read the Bible in translation or in its original languages, read it together or alone, read it on the page or recited it from memory, read it with or without a ritual prayer. When we read the Bible, we located God's power outside the words that named and described it. We called each piece of scripture a passage, and our aim in reading it was precisely that. We passed through the words on the page to get to the spiritual truth to which they were pointing. I sometimes pause to marvel at the beauty or complexity or strangeness of a passage. 
but dwelling on such specifics of language always felt a little indulgent, somehow a distraction. My religious tradition was more about movement. The primary task of our Bible reading was traveling through the trusted medium of Holy Scripture toward a perfection of knowing and doing that was somewhere out there beyond words. The Jewish way of reading I am learning is less about progressing than about digging in, holding on, not passing through words, but dwelling in them and on them, under and around them. Torah, like the ancient uh, temple, is a place to enter, experience, and revere. Holy words are things to be savored. And to study scripture is to digest the words into the body like food. Jews, in fact, refer to each piece of scripture not as passage, but as portion. In Judaism, scripture is not a signpost pointing to truth, but a portion of the truth itself, not just a promise to be fulfilled or a commandment to be obeyed, but a real-time serving of scriptural food to be tasted, chewed, and digested into the body, mind, heart, and soul. The Bible is full of references to language as food. When your words came, I ate them, the prophet Jeremiah says to the God whose voice he hears. Eat the scroll I am, go- I am giving you and fill your stomach with it, God says to the prophet Ezekiel. And to the nation of Ish- Israel entire, listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the riches of fair. Much later, the gospel writer John, ever seeking to connect Hebrew with Greek, Jewish with Christian, would call Jesus both the Word of God and the Bread of Life. The scriptures teach us how to read the scriptures, said biblical scholar Donald Ekinson, and the verses quoted above seem to me a wonderful set of clues about how to begin, to take God's words into our mouth with the same hunger and attention we bring to the food we eat. Austin Cleon says in his book, Steal Like an Artist, get yourself a calendar. Amassing a body of work or building a career is a lot about the slow accumulation of little bits of effort over time. Writing a page a day doesn't seem like much, but do it for 365 days and you have enough to fill a novel. One successful client pitch is a small victory but a few dozen of them can get you a promotion. A calendar helps you plan work, gives you concrete goals, and keeps you on track. The comedian Jerry Seinfeld has a calendar method that helps him stick to his daily joke writing. He suggests that you get a wall calendar that shows you the whole year. Then you break your work into daily chunks. Each day when you're finished with your work, make a big fat X in the day's box. Every day, instead of just getting your work done, your goal is just to fill a box. After a few days, you'll have a chain, Seinfeld says. Just keep at it and the chain will grow longer every day. You'll like seeing that chain, especially when you get a few weeks under your belt. Your only job next is to not break the chain. Get a calendar fill the boxes. Don't break the chain. Keep a logbook. Just as you need a chart of future events, you also need a chart of past events. A logbook isn't necessarily a diary or a journal. It's just a little book in which you write things you do every day. What project you worked on, where you went to lunch, what movie you saw. It's much easier than keeping a detailed diary. And you'd be amazed at how helpful having a daily record like this can be, especially over several years. The small details will help you remember the big details. In the old days, a logbook was a place for sailors to keep track of how far they'd traveled. And that's exactly what you're doing, keeping track of how far your ship has sailed. If you ask yourself, what's the best thing that happened today? It actually forces a certain kind of cheerful retrospection that pulls up from the recent past things to write about 
that you wouldn't otherwise think about. If you asked yourself what happened today, it's very likely you're going to remember the worst thing because you've had to deal with it. You've had to rush somewhere or someone said something mean to you. That's what you're going to remember. But if you ask what the best thing is, it's going to be some particular slant of light and some wonderful expression somebody said or had and some particularly delicious salad. That's a quote from Nicholson Baker. In Madeline Lango's book, Walking on Water, she says, One summer I taught a class in techniques of fiction at a Midwestern university. About halfway through the course, one of the students came up to me after class and said, I do hope you're going to teach us about writing for children. That's why I'm taking this course. What have I been teaching you? Well, writing. Don't you write when you write for children? Well, but it, isn't it different? No, it is not different. The techniques of fiction are the techniques of fiction. They hold true as for Beatrix Potter as they do for Dostoevsky. Characterization, style, theme are an important part in a children's book as in a novel for grown-ups. Tastes, as always, will differ. Spinach versus beets. A child is not likely to identify with the characters of Faulkner's Sanctuary. Books like A Wrinkle in Time may seem too difficult to some parents. But if a book is not good enough for a grown-up, is it, it is not good enough for a child. So what then are the differences? Most of them are minor and apparent. A child wants to read about another child. A child living in and having adventures in a world which can be recognized and accepted. As long as what the protagonist does is true, this world can be unlimited. For a child can identify with a hero in ancient Britain, darkest Africa, or the year 2093. When I was a child, I browsed through my parents' books when I had finished my own. What was not part of my own circumference of comprehension, I simply skipped. Sex scenes when I was eight or nine had little re relevance for me, so I skipped over them. They didn't hurt me because they had no meaning for me. In a book which is going to be marketed for children, it is usually better to write within the child's frame of reference, where there is no subject which should in itself be taboo. If it is essential for the development of the child protagonist, there is nothing which may not be included. It is how it's included which makes its presence permissible or impermissible. Some books about, for example, child abuse are important and deeply moving. Others may be little more than a form of infant pornography. Children don't like antiheroes. Neither do I. I don't think many people do, despite the proliferation of novels in the past few decades with antiheroes for protagonists. I think we all want to be able to identify with the major character in a book, to live, suffer, dream, and grow through vicarious experience. I need to be able to admire the protagonist despite his faults and so be given a glimpse of my own potential. There have been a few young adult novels written recently with antiheroes. For all reports, they are not the books which are read and reread. We don't want to feel less when we are finished when we have finished a book. We want to feel that new possibilities of being have been opened to us. We don't want to close a book with a sense that life is totally unfair and that there is no light in darkness. We want to feel that we've been given illumination.